concerns. But God is a great God. He is a God of healing, and he can help us in every situation we find ourselves in. So whatever you're dealing with this morning, we pray that the doctors and the nurses that are working with you will be in their right minds and operating their procedures properly. We know that God brings the healing, but we know that men and women have the understanding of our natural bodies to make things better. I want to pray for our nation as we seem to be on the brink of war, as troops are being mobilized to Europe and the Ukraine area and Russia. We pray that cooler heads will prevail. We pray that there's peace in the land. We pray that no bloodshed happens in that part of the world. But I want to pray for the men and women in our military, moms and dads that are being deployed on standby, that you'll bless those families, wives and husbands and children that are very concerned about their loved ones right now. We pray for our nation. It seems that the Omicron virus is dissipating, and that's good news, but we still pray for safety during this pandemic. We lift up our president this morning who needs help, that he will seek your face, God's face and direction for the decisions that he will make for this nation. We pray for our leaders statewide and locally that they look to you. I want to pray for our young people this morning. Many are very despondent. The last two and a half years under COVID restrictions have been a heavy burden on their hearts and their souls. Uh, the isolation of individuals not being able to get together uh, has, has caused some serious problems with depression. And we know that depression leads to terrible things. But we're praying for emotional safety, emotional strength today, that God will lift up our hearts and lift up our minds. And we all always know that there's no sorrow here on earth that heaven cannot heal. Those that are bereaved this morning, that God will strengthen them and guide them and wrap his arms around them and remind them that he is God. And so in spite of all the things that I mentioned, it seems like a lot, there's still good news. People are still being saved. People are still being healed. People are still being delivered. And we thank God for that around the world, people are being reminded that Jesus came to die for our sins. And now he's at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us, and we can depend on that. There's a common saying, let go and let God. I know it's hard for many to do that, but we must learn to trust him. The same God that spanned the waters in his hands, the same God that put the stars in the sky, is the same God that can bless us in our lives, calls our families to come together, calls us to learn how to forgive one another in love. So if you have a special need from the Lord today, just lift your hand toward the screen that you have and know that God hears you. We all stand in need of prayers. We all need something from the Lord. The old song goes, not my mother, not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you today that you're God. We call on your holy and your righteous name. Lord, we know that the needs are numerous. I can't even mention all of them. Lord, the phone calls and text messages that I receive all week long with people who are in dire straits in their lives uh, due to relationship problems and health issues and concerns. But Lord, I'm so glad that we can turn our heavy burdens to you and leave them there, knowing that you will never leave us or forsake us. And whatever we find ourselves standing in the need of, your God is able to provide it for us. And Lord, we say thank you this morning. We say hallelujah to your name. You're worthy of all of our praises. And Lord, everything that I mentioned earlier, the various needs among us, we pray that you would touch them. Lord, we pray that you will heal those who are sick among us. Your word tells us by the stripes that you bore on your back that we are healed from sickness and disease. So we claim healing in the name of Jesus from the crown of their heads to the sole of their feet. Lord, bring full restoration, full restoration to them, Lord that they'll be able to get up from those beds and be able to walk and let the world know that I've been healed by the mighty hand and the power of God. Lord, we're so blessed today to know that you are the God that controls nations. You're the God that controls world leaders, so we pray, Lord, that you would do such. Lord, we lift up our young people today, Lord, those that are in school and universities, Lord, that you will encourage their hearts and their minds and remind them, Lord, that you're still there with them. And although it seems that things are out of control and we're not in a normal state of living, that you are God, that you change not, and you can sustain us in every, 
every place we find ourselves in. So those that are on a mountaintop experience and those that are in the valley low, you're there with them today, and we thank you for that. And we know that you can bring peace to our minds and peace to, peace to our families, peace to our institutions and even to our churches, that we can be the light in this dying world to know that hope is still here, it's available and free with a relationship with you. So this morning, Lord, please do not forsake us, Lord. Lord, we ask for forgiveness, Lord, of the sins that we've committed. We ask for forgiveness for the sins of the nation. Lord, that you would bless us and keep us. But we're encouraged to know that your words say your seed will never beg bread. And we're depending on that this day. So we honor you in all that we do, Lord. We pray today that your church is edified and you are glorified in this worship experience. And let our prayers be as a sweet savor to your nostrils. In the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And I pray, amen and amen. We're so blessed to know that God is real. We're so blessed to know that here at Sherman Street, as we've been celebrating Black History Month, all month long, we've been blessed. The first Wednesday, we had Reverend Obadiah Smith that taught us the true name of Yahweh, Lord God. What an exciting time. Uh, this past, past Wednesday, we had a nutritionist from the Purdue Extension that talked about eating properly and our nutrition. What an awesome, awesome experience. And on this Wednesday coming up, we're going to have an exercise specialist that will come and teach us how to exercise our bodies in a safe way, even from a chair. Uh, the Black History theme for the month has been health and wellness. And we're looking at the whole person, the mind, the body, and the soul. And we need to be concerned about each and every one of them. 
And so I encourage you this Wednesday to, uh, to log on and watch our service on Wednesday evening on exercise. I believe that you will be blessed. And it will be a special treat, we, begin, we believe, at the end of the month, the fourth Sunday, as we're looking forward to a guest speaker to bring us some important information as we go forward. Today is Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. I know that's a, a word that's, <laughs> that's patented, so copyrighted. So the big game everybody's referring to. And we're talking about 151 million people will be watching this event, watching the commercials and watching the halftime show and all those things. But I'm, 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 I'm here to say this. It's amazing the things that really excite people. There are people that are excited about watching the commercials, that are excited about watching the halftime show, and there are those that are excited about the game. But I want you to be excited about our God who we worship and we serve. And as we celebrate Black History Month, I want to remind you that our history didn't begin at enslavement here in the United States, that our history goes back to the beginning of time. And so we need to teach our history all year long because black history is American history. And our children, black, white, Asian, Latino, they all need to know the experience of the true history of the United States. So we're saddened by 33 states enacting laws that will try to curl, curtail history teaching and penalize teachers and fine them. We're in a bad place right now. Instead of going forward, progressing, we're going backwards. So we pray for our nation. But we want to teach the truth of God's word. When we think about history, when we read the Old Testament, we're learning the history of the Israelites. We're learning the histories of the Jews, and nobody has a problem with that. We should be excited about learning the history of all people and all nations, because that makes us a better people, and that makes us and helps us to respect humanity as a whole. And so today, as we look at this story from Northern Africa, very familiar to you, the story of Joseph, the boy with the beautiful coat of many colors. When we think about Joseph, and you know the story, his father Jacob, who had 12 sons, basically three different mothers, so it was totally a dysfunctional family, yet he loved Joseph above the other sons because in his old age with his last wife, Rachel, he bore a son. And there was another son that came after Joseph, Benjamin, we know that, but Jacob was excited about it. And Joseph was a dreamer, and he had very, very patented dreams, and he was able to interpret his dreams. And he had very one particular lucid dream where he told his brothers that they would bow down to him. They already didn't like him, and now he's talking about they're going to bow down to him one day. Recognize, not realizing that God was working in this young man's life at 17 years old. He went out to meet his brothers at Shechem, and they were there, and they had plotted to kill him. But yet the older brother Reuben said, well, let's not kill him. Let's sell him into slavery. And so they sold him to a caravan going to Egypt, coming from Shechem and Canaan to Egypt. And they sold him for 20 shekels, the price of a slave at that time. Little did they know that even in their badness, even in their evilness, even in their hatred of their own brother, that sibling rivalry, they didn't understand that God had an ultimate plan for Joseph. And so this morning, to take a sermon theme, it will be forgiveness brings peace. Or you can say from prison to the palace. Somebody say prison to the palace. I'm so fascinated by this story because it shows how God can work through negative situations for a positive outcome. And I think about what happened there with Joseph in Egypt, northern Africa, and how he went in as a slave, but he rose to the position of, 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 of vicester or a prime minister of all of Egypt, second to Pharaoh. We know it didn't start off that way. He was sold to Potiphar, one of uh, Pharaoh's commanding officers. And he was over Potiphar's house, and he managed everything of his house. But we know his wife was very smitten with him and wanted to be with him, yet he denied her, and she lied and said that he attempted to rape her. When Potiphar came home, he put him in prison for two years. Two years. And during this time that he was in prison, Pharaoh had dreams, and he could not get any of his wise men to interpret these dreams. And then uh, uh, the, 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 the cupbearer said, what about that? young man in prison who understands dreams. And they brought Joseph up and he asked God to help him with the interpretation and he told Pharaoh that your dreams are saying that there's going to be seven years of prosperity and seven years of famine. And Pharaoh was so excited that this young man was able to interpret his dreams that he put a robe on him and a gold chain around his neck and he promoted him to be second in command of all the kingdom of Egypt. And Joseph was diligent in his job and he did it well. Now let's fast forward to the story. 
Everything he said came to pass. God was working in his life. Everything that he predicted in the dream came true. So he became even more influential and powerful because his predictions came right. But when the famine came in the land, his brothers were still in Canaan. And yet the famine was there. They had to go to Egypt to try to get grain so that they would not starve to death. Little did they know that the person they had to have a conversation with to receive those wares was their own brother that they sold into slavery. Now, the story's even worse than that because they told their father that uh, Joseph was killed by a wild animal. And they took that beautiful colored robe and they dipped it in blood and showed it to him. The father just ripped his clothes off. He was mourning because his favorite son was killed. He was so distraught. Let's talk about sibling rivalry. A lot of dysfunctional families today are still happening because we have brothers and sisters that are competing with each other. We have brothers and sisters that are always in competition. We have men and women of age, uh, of wealth and age, who uh, still, don't, still don't speak to one another. I know what I'm talking about. Pastoring years and seeing families in mourning situations and seeing siblings fight over property and homes and, and possessions of the one that has passed on and they have not spoken in 20 years and 25 years over land disputes and inheritance. Oh, this sibling robbery is not only for young people. This goes into well people's ages who are older when they do not learn how to love one another and forgive one another. Oh, this is a hard message for some to take this morning because they know right now that there's aught between them and their sister or aught between them and their brother. And I'm here to let you know right now, as long as you have aught between you and someone else, that your prayers aren't going to be answered. You need to make sure that you have a clean slate, a clean bill between you and your loved ones and the people that you deal with. As we look at this story today, it's an interesting story. Joseph the dreamer, able to interpret those dreams, his brothers hated him. His father loved him. What a place to be, a place where your father loves you and your brothers hate you. What a sad story. As I mentioned earlier, famine came into Canaan. 21 years later, 21 years later, I want you to understand that. 21 years later, he sees his brothers again. They didn't even recognize them. And those that want to say something, think about it. He was in Egypt coming from Canaan, yet he looked just like the Egyptians. So those of you that want to think that these people were of European heritage, I want to just let you know today, let's look at the truth of the matter. They didn't recognize him because he looked just like a Northern African, an Egyptian, who Josephus and all the other historians said were dark-skinned people with curly hair. So don't let Hollywood fool you to think you know what the Egyptians really look like. They were people of dark hue from northern Africa. There's a point for your history, your black history. As I said, your black history didn't begin at the enslavement of us by Europeans. It goes back to the beginning of time. Now, we have to look at Jacob. He caused most of these problems because of favoritism. I want to challenge our fathers and mothers to make sure that we treat our children equally. I know that they have different characteristics. One may be tall and one may be short and one may be smarter or more wise than the other, but they're still your children. You should love them and treat them equally, yet Jacob didn't do that. And we see what happened in that situation. The brothers were so mad and angry because of the favoritism, it divided the family for years. Understand that children are different, but we must appreciate them all. We must love them equally, treat them fairly, and do not be overly biased in some of your considerations toward one child against another. You may have been around a dinner table at Thanksgiving or sometime, and somebody said, well, Mom, you know he's your favorite or she's your favorite. It shouldn't be that way. We should love them all the same. We must also recognize that when your brother and your sister wrong you, forgiveness is the best divine quality that you can ever possess. Forgiveness. When I thought about this situation here in Africa, in northern Egypt, in, in Egypt and northern Africa, I thought about another situation in Africa in recent years that forgiveness paid the price and forgiveness won the day. Now, going from North Africa to South Africa, I want to talk about apartheid and uh, Matiba Nelson Mandela. A hero of mine, uh, growing up in my house, most people in the South had a picture of Martin Luther King and JFK. My family had Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela and pictures on the wall. What an exciting person who was a Christian. He was a Methodist. He was a Christian. But I want to say something about forgiveness. Here he was 
in prison on Robin's Island for 27 years, and he went from prison to the palace. Like Joseph went from prison to the palace. I'm here to let you know right now, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how hard things seem to be right now, regardless of where you may find yourself, God is not through with you yet. We look at Nelson, 27 years in prison, and we looked at Joseph, who spent over 12, 14 years in prison total, yet God lifted him up out of a prison situation, brought him to the palace, and put him in a place with authority. Like Nelson, same on the continent of Africa, God brought another man out of prison after 27 years and lifted him up to be the president of South Africa. During that time in apartheid, the minorities, which were the, uh, the Europeans in South Africa that controlled for so many years, they were very afraid about retaliation over all the things that they have done in apartheid all those years. Yet, uh, Nelson and his administration uh, developed their Reconciliation Commission with Desmond Tutu and uh, an F.D. de Klerk. And yet, they brought those people to trial, but it was not like the Nuremberg trial. They didn't punish those that caused the wrongdoings. When the people acknowledged their wrongdoings, they forgave them and, clean, and wiped the slate clean. And that preserved South Africa, and that's how the country survived. Ooh, forgiveness is something, huh? I'm thinking about Joseph, who spent 12 years in prison, sold into slavery, thrown into a pit by his own brothers, yet he was able to forgive them. I think about Nelson, 27 years in prison, yet he comes out and was able to forgive the guards of the prison and forgive those that held him a uh, bondage for all those years, yet he forgave them when he became the king. And some of us, and some of y'all, get mad if somebody step on your toes or step on your shoes. And that's not even a year, that's a second, and you don't forgive them. Some of us get mad at somebody cutting us off in traffic, and we have a hard time. I'm here to let you know that our patience and our consideration needs to be long-standing. We need to make sure that we have patience, that it's long-standing, and we learn to forgive and love people in spite of their flaws. Why? Because we have flaws ourselves, and people have forgiven us. Praise his holy name. Aren't you glad that everybody's not holding you for everything you did in the past? I'm glad everybody's not holding me for everything I've done, and I'm glad that I'm not holding you for everything you've done. I've learned years ago, let go and let God. And let me tell you something. You can't get nobody back better than God can get somebody. Let God handle the situation. He can work it out. He can bless it. He can take care of the situation. I'm challenging all of us today to learn how to forgive because forgiveness brings peace. When we look at the world's conditions right now, and I mentioned early on about how so many people are despondent and so many people are discouraged and so many people are angry over the last couple of years because of COVID-19 and the pandemic. One thing, as I said a couple of weeks ago, when you go through the hard times, don't become bitter, you become better. You become better and not bitter. I know it's been hard, but you're going to be better because of it. I know it's been hard, but you're going to have patience because of it. I know it's been difficult, but you're going to love God more because he sustained you and brought you through it. Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody ought to say forgiveness brings peace. Somebody under the sound of my voice right now is holding their mom and holding their dad and holding an uncle or holding an aunt or holding a cousin for something they did and you haven't forgiven them yet and yet you're bitter and unhappy and I'm here to let you know you need to let that thing go because forgiveness brings peace. Even Jesus on the cross when he's being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Are we able to forgive? This message is so important today because a nation that as is as divided as our nation right now, and we don't speak about forgiveness and love, we will continue to go down this path of uh, divisiveness and more, more, more vocal and vocalization of the country, and we form these various tribes, and all we're going to have is a bunch of blood and warshed, uh, warfare and blood in our nation because those who have not learned how to forgive. Think about South Africa. Think about the Reconciliation Commission and how they were able to forgive and save that nation. We need to have such a thing here in this country. I really believe that. We never dealt with the wrongs of the past. We never dealt 
with, the, with the, uh, America's original sin. But one thing I can say, thank God for those that are born again believers that have learned how to forgive and learn how to seek peace with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I pray for our nation that they will talk about forgiveness. I pray for our nation that they will talk about peace. I pray for our nation that they will seek the face of God through his son Jesus Christ and establish a relationship with him so that we can be a blessed people. Now we go back to Joseph. After 21 years and his family comes and we know the story how they came and Joseph did not, uh, did not reveal himself immediately. He, see, he, he said, is there another brother? And they said, yes, there's a younger one. That was Benjamin, his younger brother. He says, go back and bring him with me if you want something from us. I want to make sure that you're serious about the situation and that you're not spies. He knew they weren't spies. He knew those were his brothers, but he was not ready to reveal himself at the time yet. And they went away and they came back with Benjamin. And then he said, feed them in my house. And the brothers went to Joseph's house and he fed them and gave them food and gave them drink and gave them supplies. But on the way out, he stuck a silver goblet and he told his servants to put that goblet in Benjamin's bundle because I want to do something. And when they left, he sent his people behind his brothers and said that something is missing from my house. And they open all the bundles and all of a sudden they find a silver goblet in Benjamin's, Benjamin's um, bundle. And so they brought him back to Joseph and Joseph said, I'm keeping him here with me as a ransom. We know Joseph really wanted to get to know his younger brother. And that's why he brought him to be with him to be his servant. And they went back and told the father. And he said, bring the father back. And they brought them back. And when Joseph revealed themselves, the brothers were shocked, fell down, and cried, and knew that they would probably be killed because of his position. Yet he said, no harm will come to you, because I forgive you. And that's love. That's love. I think about how bitter Joseph could have been. My brothers, who threw me in a cistern, an empty well, and then when the caravan came by, they sold me into slavery to Egypt. And here it is 21 years later. And now I'm here in a position to bless them. So that initial dream before he got the colorful robe came true, that his brothers would bow down to him. I'm here to let you know today that God is still working through the hearts and the minds of people. And regardless of how bad your situation seems, it could be God is not through with you yet. So right now, if you find yourself in a prison population, God can take you to a palace. If you find yourselves in a situation of bondage, of addiction, of alcohol or drugs or pornography or, 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 or just greed itself. God can forgive you of that and God can deliver you of those things. You don't have to be bond, in bondage. When I thought about money this morning, I thought about how they believe that 31 million people will bet on the game today, the Super Bowl, and the billions that are being spent on these apps that are devices on people's telephones and they become in bondage to gambling. I saw a report the other day where a man said 3 o'clock in the morning he was betting on Russian ping pong. How sad is that? Because of the love of money and greed, people and families are losing their homes and losing all of their investments because of those that are addicted to this thing called gambling. So bondage to greed and money is something that people need to be delivered from as well. But you know, we should worship and serve a God that can take you from the prison to the palace. Take you from the prison to the palace in South Africa as he did Nelson Mandela. Aren't you glad to know that kind of God? Praise his holy name. The power of forgiveness is a divine gift. We choose to forgive, but God empowers us to forgive. When we cannot do it, when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, God will give us the strength to be able to forgive those who have hurt us. God's intervention is genuine. His genuine forgiveness really takes place in our lives where we can learn to love folk who hated us once in the past. The early years of Joseph's life is a case study of a dysfunctional family, of hatred of brothers and jealousy and sibling rival, yet he rose above that and God promoted him to a high place and his family was blessed because of that. When we think about Nelson Mandela, how he was in prison because he represented the ANC for 27 years, yet when he got out, he had no malice and he had forgiveness and God blessed him. When we look at Genesis chapter 41 and we think about the seven years of plenty that arrived to Egypt, and the other 11 brothers were also suffering from the famine in Canaan. The 10 brothers came to Egypt to buy corn, but the youngest, Rachel's son Benjamin, stayed home with their father Jacob. When Joseph recognized his half-brothers, 
he realized that he had to forgive them. Joseph gives them the supplies of grain, and he blesses them. And we think about the end of the story. Eventually, the whole clan comes to Egypt. And Joseph is reunited with his father, Jacob. And he's excited to love and hug on him. And his, son is, his father says, I'm ready to die now. My son is alive. And yet, Joseph was able to bring his two sons there and let his father see his grandchildren. And he blessed them. Ephraim, he gave the birthright to in Manasseh. It's amazing how wonderful the story ends because, see, God was in the picture. God was in the mix. Any other situation like this, we would think this is one of the worst stories we've ever heard, but we don't know the end of the story. We worship and serve a God who knows the end of your story. We worship and serve a God that knows the end of my story. Our job is to have hope and faith in God and trust him in whatever situation we find ourselves in, believing that he is a deliverer, believing that he is a rewarder, believing that he will help us, those that diligently seek him. And Lord, we diligently seek you. One of the most powerful things or men in Egypt was Joseph. <coughs> Excuse me. But 21 years later, he was able to forgive his brothers. Please understand that our relationships do not thrive because of the guiltiness of unforgiveness. Please understand that we are despondent and discouraged at work. But we have, because we have co-workers that have wronged that have done us wrong, we have not forgiven them. And we find people so bitter and angry on the job because of situations like that and in school and other institutions. But today we're looking to the hills which cometh our help, our help cometh from the Lord, and we want to be blessed and we want to have forgiveness so it brings peace. Verse 5 says once again, But now do not therefore be grieved or, any, or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. What seems impossible for us is possible with God. When you look at a young man at 17 years old, sold to another country, yet he was being able to be elevated to the second highest position in the country, Egypt, because of who God is. I'm excited to know and excited to pray that God will bless you and lift you up to a place where you can be held in esteem and worshiping and honoring the one true God. So those of you right now that find yourselves in a place of bondage, you may not be physically in prison, but there's a bondage in the mind, there's a bondage on your soul, there's a bondage on your will, we're asking God to release you from that. Release you from that. If there's someone in your life who's hurt you, and disappointed you, and discouraged you, maybe have even abused you, I'm going to ask you to forgive that person so that you can have peace in your life. As long as you're holding somebody, you cannot move. You have to let them go so that you can progress and so that you can move. Today, as we end this particular sermon, we're reminded that forgiveness brings peace. In a nation as divided as ours is right now, Until we learn to forgive, there's not going to be peace. So whomever, offer forgiveness. And forgiveness is a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. Down through the years, God has sustained us as a people because we've learned how to forgive. And we trusted the word of God and trusted God to bring us a mighty, mighty long way. The same God that brought us out of shadowed slavery. It's the same God that lifted lifted us up during Reconstruction. The same God that blessed us through the Civil Rights Movement. And it's the same God that's going to sustain us in these times in which we live now where some folk are trying to turn back the clock. Now, I want to let you know that I'm very familiar with what's happening in our nation. Back in the early 1980s, when I was working in corporate America, we projected the demographic shifts in the United States around 2024. And as a Fortune 100 company, we're very concerned about making money with all people. But they were predicting how the unsettling the nation would be around this time. And it's happening. Because those in the majority see themselves losing power because of a minority group that's going to eventually become the majority. And they are afraid of losing power. So 
So they're going to change laws and do everything to hold that power. I'm here to let you know you need to respect people of who they are, regardless of their ethnicity, and know that they're created human beings just like you, and learn how to forgive and learn how to support one another. If we don't learn how to do that, then maybe we'll be spoken of as many nations of the past. America was when America was. The challenge is ours today. And we who are the church, we must set the standard for believing and forgiving. We must set the standard for loving those who are not so lovable. We must set the standing, the standard for going forward for peace and love in the world today. I pray today that you've been encouraged, you've been blessed by the word that's been shared. But most importantly, you would take it upon yourself as an individual to be a conduit of love. That you'll be a conduit of forgiveness. That if nobody else is forgiven, you're willing to do that. Because your Savior was able to forgive us. I pray today if you're having a tumultuous experience in your life and you need peace, I invite you to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life as your Lord and personal Savior. It makes all the difference in the world. I know without a shadow of a doubt, if I have not been saved from my sins and I did not have the Lord in my life, I know how bitter life could be for me. And people see me and they say I smile all the time and I'm happy. It's not because of who I am, it's because of whose I am. And as the song poet said, the joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. So I pray today that you will make that decision to let Jesus Christ be your Lord and Savior. And that you will seek forgiveness and offer forgiveness so that you can have peace in your life. Will you bow your heads with me at this time? Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for your word today, Lord, how we have been reminded from Genesis chapter 45, how Joseph was able to forgive his brothers after 21 years estranged. And you reestablished that family and brought them back together again after all those years. And you preserved Israel, preserved Judah, preserved Jacob and the clan because of Joseph. Lord, we thank you for allowing Nelson Mandela for 27 years. He languished in that prison, but he was prepared when he came out to lead, like Joseph, from prison to the palace. We pray right now, Lord, that some of us may find ourselves in some type of bondage in our minds, or bondage to habits, or bondage to addictions. We pray, Lord, that you'll release it in the name of Jesus, and take that away, Lord, that we can go from prison to the palace. And from forgiveness to peace. We know you're able to do that, Lord, and we claim that in the name of Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for being with us today, Lord. We pray as we prepare to leave this place but not your presence, that you will continue to protect us and keep us. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Well, we thank you so much for being with us this morning at the Sherman Street Church of God. We pray that you have been blessed. We look forward to speaking with you on next week. During this week, please stay safe. May God keep and bless each and every one of you. Thank you.